Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our Tuesday night online Bible study here at Trinity Baptist. Uh, I have pre-recorded this particular uh, message today, but I am online on our Facebook page Tuesday night uh, to interact with you live, starting at 7 o'clock, if you'd like to interact with me there. And if, if you catch us later and you comment later on, I'll be checking back from time to time. I'd love to hear from you, though, and make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, this is kind of a small group. It's an online thing. Uh, but there are, of course, many other uh, small groups that are happening here at Trinity. Some of them are happening within our building safely. Uh, others are happening online or other kinds of means. So if you'd like to be connected a little bit more, just give me a call and I'll try and set you up with some other kinds of options that we have. This particular study that we do every Tuesday night, as many of you know, it's pretty thick on Bible content. We stick pretty close to the text as we walk through different books of the Bible. So it kind of um, contrasts a little bit with what you might call like a devotional reading or a devotional thought for the day that you might start the day with and then get on with work or school or whatever. Uh, those things certainly have their place, but this is kind of a something where we buckle our seatbelts and we get into a text and we dig deep and, and try and walk through it. Uh, this particular fall season, we are walking through the Old Testament book of Daniel. And uh, the way that we are kind of talking about Daniel and, and us and how this all relates is just seeing the faithfulness that Daniel and his friends have to God in circumstances that are out of their control as exiles living in Babylon. Of course, that has its own context, but there's a little bit of a, a parallel for us. We need to be faithful to God even in these times. We find ourselves in circumstances well beyond our control right now. And so we want to get some inspiration from them in the way that they have been faithful to God. Today's story is from Daniel chapter 3, and it's a really famous story. Many of you know this one. It's, it's about the fiery furnace. Uh, some of you might have been uh, raised in Sunday school and you remember hearing some of the stories like this one. Um, but maybe maybe it's been a while since you've actually looked at this story through um, through the lens of an adult uh, and some of our adult thinking and questions that come to bear on the text and on our everyday lives. So here's a few things about uh, this particular story. The main characters, as we will see them, we will see King Nebuchadnezzar again, the king of Babylon. Again, he's going to prove himself to be a very unstable man. Uh, in contrast, we're going to see Daniel's three amazing friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they were renamed, uh, and just see how faithful they were to God, especially when they were really facing the heat here. <laughs> and I kind of mean that uh, as a little bit of a pun. Uh, some other minor characters, we see some astrolog astrologers show up. They have a minor role. Uh, it's an important role and a very annoying role, I might add, too. Uh, but interestingly enough, even though this book is named after Daniel, Daniel does not appear in this particular chapter anyway. So this story, as we'll see, it's about refusing to worship the empire by worshiping one of these statues or idols that they put up. It's going to be paralleled later on. Chapter 3 will be paralleled with chapter 6 with a, a very similar story, that one about Daniel in particular, and the lion's den, another story about refusing to worship the empire. Well, in our day, maybe to kind of get us into this a little bit, I want us to think about some of the news stories that we have uh, had kind of scroll across the, the news ticker the last number of weeks and months. Uh, we've had some people who, uh, for different reasons, have uh, toppled or defaced historical statues here in um, in our country and in other countries. And a lot of people have reacted very strongly to that, either for or against that. And uh, I'm not here to give a particular, um, you know, weigh in on that particular issue. That's probably something that deserves a lot more time. But uh, I kind of smile a little bit at it. Uh, I don't have much skin in the game, so maybe that's why I can smile. But I do think when I read the pages of scripture front to back, I just never see statues going too well for us. Um, it begs the question, why do we have statues at all in our society? That's maybe a question I ask. Why do we present certain heroes as people for us to revere and, and remember? Maybe there's some maybe there's some value in that. I'm not saying that, that it's horrible or evil, but um, in the Bible anyway, as we see over and over again, statues that are made to um, appear 
you know, as, as things for us to revere and, and maybe even worship as in this particular chapter, like none of this ever ends well. So <laughs> maybe we should just stop building statues. Anyway, I've probably uh, ticked off a few people online already who maybe will stop watching at this point, but I really want us to actually get into the text. So as we get into the text, I would love for you to have a question that you have kind of filtering everything that you read about this particular story uh, through. The question is this, biblically speaking, what is our country allowed and not allowed to ask of us? I'll say it one more time. Biblically speaking, what is our country allowed and not allowed to ask of us? Be thinking of that as we get into the text. So we're in Daniel chapter 3, starting at, uh, at verse 1. Uh, this whole thing is, is about, uh, this first little section, I should say, is about a golden image being made and then dedicated and then compelling people to worship it. So the first three verses talk about how this image was made and uh, some of the invites being sent out for the dedication. Verse 1 goes like this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high, that's about 90 feet, and 6 cubits wide, that's 9 feet, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. There's some irony here to Nebuchadnezzar building a statue or um, an image. Uh, for example, like the statue vision that we just walked through last week in chapter 2 uh, is, is a you know, kind of a, a bad thing, the way that the statue is made and how it all crumbles and it doesn't last forever. Um, and this vision ends with Nebuchadnezzar praising God, praising the true God. Um, but it's like he didn't learn anything from the end of chapter two. It flips right here into chapter three, where he's building, of all things, a statue. Not the brightest bulb here. <laughs> this, this guy's not the brightest bulb in the ceiling. Little irrational, little unstable. We'll see more of that. In fact, even his the statue that he made is kind of unstable, how tall it is and, and not very wide. Anyway, but he made this image of gold. Again, this is an echo back to chapter 2, where um, in the vision that he was given, uh, Daniel interprets it and tells him he's the head of gold. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is. And uh, it's like Nebuchadnezzar kind of wanted to take that on steroids and build a whole thing out of gold. So he does this. Uh, it's the same Hebrew word for image and statue, both in chapter 2 and chapter 3, just so you know that. I don't know why the English translators kind of swapped it around a little bit. It's the same same word. But I kind of wonder, too, whether this image of a, uh, uh, made out of gold is a little bit of an echo as well, at least in the Israelite story, of the golden calf back in the, in the wilderness. You might remember that story from the book of Exodus. And if you were a Jewish reader reading the book of Daniel and hearing about this big image made out of gold, it would probably raise a big red flag for you and make you think, well, this is not so good. But anyway, we've got this really tall, unstable image made out of gold, and it's set up in all things. Uh, it's set up in the province of Babylon. Remember this little detail? End of chapter 2 where um, Daniel gets promoted by Nebuchadnezzar and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, also get uh, promoted to be administrators over the province of Babylon. Okay, we've already got a conflict coming in right away because we have this image that's been made and set up in their province. Mm, you can see the storm clouds brewing. This is not going to go over too well. Anyway, verses 2 and 3, invitations are sent out and accepted. All these people uh, gather, and in verses 4 and 5 and 6, you see how a herald proclaims a universal call or a universal commandment that everyone is supposed to bow down and worship this image. In other words, worship this empire or else. There's a punishment that's listed. They'll be thrown into this blazing furnace. There, there's no positive reward given for Go ahead and do this. Just a negative one if you don't. This blazing furnace, just so you know, it'd be kind of similar to a kiln. If you've ever done any kind of ceramic work or things like that. Um, apparently, this was a somewhat common execution tool in the ancient Near East, especially in the age of Persia. And let's remember, too, the people who were assembled here weren't all just free citizens of Babylon. Many of these folks would have been people who would have been captured or exiled from other countries, including Israel. They would have been 
gone, you know, they would have had to go through this uh, reprogramming program that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had been part of. We see that back in chapter one. And here they are in this big assembly being told they have to bow down to this image, to this God, to this empire, and proclaim allegiance and worship to it. From the Babylonian perspective, uh, this was an act of bragging about the fact that they won and their patriotism and making sure that other people are always submitting to them. Now remember, everything back then was spiritual. There was no like sacred and secular divide. Uh, for them, this was just, hey, like our gods are bigger, our gods are stronger, we're the champions, you guys are the losers, so we're gonna make you worship our gods and our empire. Uh, you know, we think that we might be able to separate secular and, and, and sacred in our day, but I don't know. Can we Can we really? Is it really that easy within the human heart? Or is there spiritual forces and things behind what seems to be just a secular thing? Anyway, I'll have to let that question linger. In, in verse 7, we see, though, that in response to this command, the masses have this automatic, unquestioned obedience and worship. Yikes. Maybe they're all too scared. I don't know. Um, maybe they're just swallowing the Kool-Aid. Nobody objected except for these three Israelites, and we'll get to their story soon. But first, uh, maybe just as a way to kind of connect this even to uh, today's world, many of you will remember within our church um, and within Canada, the issue that we faced a few years ago with the Canada Summer Jobs Grant. And, uh, you know, it caused a lot of frustration for us as churches, a lot of confusion, like where did this come from? Some herald kind of came along and told us, unless you sign here, you're not going to qualify for this summer jobs grant funding that you guys have always been able to get alongside everybody else. It was frustrating um, because it was a, a compelled speech thing. It, you know, we had to, uh, it wasn't even so much about what you had to say or like what the values were, although that was, there was a bit of an issue. It was the fact that we had to say anything at all, that we were compelled into an action. In our case, it was signing on the dotted line, agreeing to a particular statement. Whereas in Daniel's case, uh, or here in this case in chapter three, uh, it's a compelled action of worshiping the empire. In both cases, though, that compelling of other people i mean it just it just rubs you the wrong way it's, n it's not a good thing uh thankfully for us the canada summer jobs grant issue uh, is an idea that's gone away for the time being um we'll see what the future holds but uh it sure seemed to wake a lot of people up and it made this chapter actually really alive at least in my biblical imagination uh, anyway okay back to the story verses 8 through 12 uh, basically tell us how someone calls the snitch line on these three guys who didn't bow. Uh, let's read verses, uh, just the beginning of verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Some astrologers. Uh, if you have a footnote in your Bible, it might say the Chaldeans. Uh, so you could kind of go either way with the translation there. The Chaldeans were, of course, uh, the people, like their nationality was was basically the Babylonians. Um, so these were native people of around that area. Um, these are the ones back in chapter 2 who argued with Nebuchadnezzar about his seemingly insane request for them to first tell him his dream and then to interpret it. You kind of wonder if they're still in hot water or thin ice or whatever you want to call it. These are the ones, though, that by the end of chapter 2, Daniel had saved from death. Everyone was going to die unless somebody interpreted this dream. And Daniel did it and saved not just his life, but a whole bunch of people's lives. Um, but they don't seem to have really cared. That hasn't necessarily changed their opinion of these Jews. Uh, you know that at the end of chapter two, as we've already talked about, Daniel and his friends were promoted. And it seems like maybe some astrologers here are a little bit jealous. And they're looking for a way to maybe get back at them somehow. Uh, yeah, and you can see at the end of chapter 8, it says that they uh, came forward and they denounced the Jews. It just seems like blatant racism, xenophobia maybe, these outsiders who have come in. They don't like it. And so, of course, they complain. They call the snitch line, so to speak, and go to the king. And in verse 12, let's see what it says. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Oh boy. <laughs> Again, these guys seem really jealous. They seem petty, maybe racist. Um, and they're going after, they're going to go after him and see how it all kind of blows up. Um, well, let's leave that for now and, and let's kind of move on to the next scene. The scene switches now to what should start to become for us a pretty familiar sight in the book of Daniel. There are so many times where there's either a court contest or a court conflict. So be thinking again, these people are sitting in the corridors of power. And it's almost like a court scene where someone's on trial, so to speak. And we see that happening here, another conflict. In, in verse 13, uh, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar sum summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Furious with, with rage, instant anger. Again, he's really unstable guy. We're going to see that fury again in verse 19. Um, but his fury here, it's based on secondhand information. At least he brings these guys forward so we can hear straight from their mouths what uh, what they're up to. And so he asks him, uh, he asks these guys three questions. You know, basically, is it true that you bowed down or that you didn't bow down when you were supposed to? Will you bow down if I give you a second chance? And if you don't, what God can save you anyway? Uh, I like how that uh, question is asked by him at the very end of verse 15. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Oh, funny. It's uh, kind of a funny, ironic question. Of course, it's going to be answered in its own way soon enough. Um, but you can see the bold reply that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego have. They basically plead no contest. They say, yeah, we didn't bow. Uh, we're not going to bow, even if you give us a second chance. And Actually, to answer your third question, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not serve your gods or bend the knee to that image of gold. I love it. Uh, they're respectful. They're not just being uh, annoying little brats or little rebels or whatever. Uh, but they're appealing to religious liberty. They basically uh, want to follow their conscience uh, and be faithful to God. Love it. We live in a country that has religious liberty. It's, it's uh, protected for us as a right. And, and of course, we can be grateful for that. In fact, I think we should be protecting the rights, not just, of course, of our own folks, but people of any religion or no religion. Uh, we want that kind of freedom for everybody, because only if everybody has that freedom will we guarantee that we have that freedom. Uh, we don't want the government to be picking winners and losers when it comes to religious liberty. Everyone should have the ability to follow their conscience and to follow their religious uh, beliefs, even if even if those beliefs are counter to the majority view. And hey, we know in, in our society, it's not that everyone hates Christians. I'm not trying to do a pity party, but not all of our views are accepted by the majority. And we want the freedom. In fact, we need the courage to maintain those convictions, even if it's not the uh, the majority view. Well, anyway, they said their piece. It didn't go so well. Nebuchadnezzar is furious again, and you can see that in verse 19. He's really mad. So he cranks up the furnace heat. Uh, again, these furnaces were used for executions apparently back in the day, and it seems to have just been sitting there for a prop the whole time as an intimidation thing. But they crank it up. These three guys get uh, bound very securely so that they're not being able to get out. Um, and uh, they're thrown into the furnace. But the furnace is so hot that even some people who are in charge of throwing them in there are killed in the process. That, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and then, lo and behold, as we all know, if you've read the story before, something pretty spectacular happens. King Nebuchadnezzar, he leaps to his feet in amazement. He asks, like, didn't we throw three guys in there? Why do I seem to see four? And, of course, everyone looks and they're able to see that uh, the fourth one looks like He's walking around free, unharmed, unbound. He looks like a son of the gods. Christian commenters uh, over the centuries have for a long time believed that this perhaps is a pre-Christmas or pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, who's there standing with uh, these other three in the blazing furnace. Maybe, maybe not. Um, can't say really for sure. Later on in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar um, talks about this, this thing or this being as if it's an angel. So maybe it's only that. But anyway, we'll get down to verse 26. Let me read that one out loud. Uh, 
Um, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out here. Uh, Cyrus will do a similar sort of thing in chapter 6 in that story that parallels this one. I do find it a little ironic that he calls them servants of the Most High. They were not going to serve Nebuchadnezzar's gods, and uh, now it's like he has to kind of almost eat his words by saying servants of the Most High God. But anyway, they come out, everybody inspects them. It's verifiably true that the true God had miraculously preserved them through the fire. Amazing. And then Nebuchadnezzar responds in the last three verses of the chapter. He praises the true God, Yahweh, again. He did that at the end of chapter 2. He does it here again. Um, and, of course, he had to eat his words a little bit in doing so. Um, and then he seems to, in his own way, using his own words, tell the moral of the story. And then you see that in the second half of verse 28. He says, they, like these three guys, they trusted in him, in God, and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. I couldn't say it better myself. That's the moral of the story put on the lips of Nebuchadnezzar himself. And, you know, if it ended there, that'd be awesome. But then in verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar does one more knee-jerk reaction. He basically issues a new decree saying, you're not allowed to diss the Jewish god or else we're going to come and wreck your home and, and uh, you know, cut you up and do all this violent stuff. And I'm just like, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, just stop. Just stop talking like that. You're such an unstable guy. These guys don't need that. But anyway, at the end of it all, of course, what does he do? Nebuchadnezzar promotes these three guys even higher in the province of Babylon, which is hilarious because the astrologers who were probably jealous and racist and all that, they would not have liked the way that the story ended at all. Um, but the three guys are vindicated, and off they go. So we reach the end of the chapter, and, uh, oh, I got a sneeze. Ah, I held it off. Uh, no, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <laughs> um, what do we do with the story? Well, looking ahead to the New Testament, there's uh, there's some cool stuff from Hebrews 11. You know, might know this as kind of like a really, um, I call it the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And later on in chapter 11, it says this, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, that, that's going to show up later in Daniel 6, quenched the fury of the flames, seems to be our story here, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. It's neat. Um, New Testament believers look back here at the faithfulness of these folks and the God who saved them, and it gave them so much strength. And I think we can do that too, looking at these stories for inspiration. Secondly, notice though that these men were, were not saved from the fiery furnace, but they were saved in it. God was right with them there in the midst of it. And for us, God does not promise to shield us from going through fiery ordeals, uh, whether they be something as blatant as religious persecution here, or whether it be through sickness or anything. He doesn't promise that we're not going to face any of this stuff, but he does promise us uh, that he's going to be with us in the midst of it. And that's a promise we can cling to. But I did ask you at the very beginning to ponder this question. Biblically speaking, what is our country allowed and not allowed to ask of us? Interesting. I'll let you chew on that a little bit. Biblically speaking, what is our country allowed and not allowed to ask of you? I mean, how will you respond when perhaps the government asks something that we really can't do? How will you respond? I think these men give us a wonderful example of people who are kind, uh, who are respectful, but who are very firm in their convictions and are willing to face whatever consequences just to be faithful to their Lord. Awesome. Well, next week, we are going to venture into chapter four. We're going to see another dream that's given to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's going to be back in the mix, and it'll be kind of fun. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for about this last 25 minutes or so. I hope you have a great week. 
feel free to leave a question or a comment uh, in, in the space here in, in Facebook uh, to let me know or to interact me, with me some other way. Anyway, uh, we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much.